All right, we're going to... No, I got 5.30 on mine. Uh, sprint time. It's 5.30. Okay. With that said, uh, we'll, uh, we're coming back from recess of closed session. Our closed session will be recessing back into closed session uh, after the general meeting. Uh, but right now, we're in our presentation period at 5.30, and I do not see the person that's going to claim the proclamation for Harvey Milk Day 2016 here yet, so I think we're going to start with DVD. We have a presentation by Desert Valley Disposal and Chris Cunningham. <laughs> and he brought his own fan club with him today. <laughs> I do that, too. I bring Michael everywhere. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, <laughs> Council members and uh, staff, uh, appreciate the time. I'm Chris Cunningham, Desert Valley Disposal. And what I want to do for you uh, this evening is just to give you an update on this new program that the uh, city of Desert Hot Springs approved. It's a pilot program aimed at uh, getting rid of all the illegal dumping that's been going on for years, years. Uh, so I put together a small PowerPoint for you with plenty of pictures to kind of show where we're at. Um, so we'll get started here. Uh, the goal. We all know what the problem is. Uh, it's been an issue for a very long time. Uh, illegal dumping. Um, it's, it's such an eyesore. Every time you drive down Palm, you see it. And uh, to catch up with this has been very difficult. So the goal is to eliminate legal dumping of vacant lots, major roadways, alleyways, wherever our guys see it, we want to get rid of it. So that's the goal. Uh, the solution We've had a lot of different solutions. Um, so many council member led cleanups. Uh, DHS pickup crews done a lot. Um, I mean, we were doing cleanups every week for months at some point. Um, and it looked great for the weekend, and then a few days later, you just see they turned into dump sites. Uh, so keeping up with it was proving to be almost impossible. So after discussions with council member McKee, council member Betts, and DHS pickup crew residents, uh, we figured the best possible solution is a permanent crew. Uh, two man, five, five days a week, eight hours a day, committed to just collecting illegal dumping. Um, so that's what the council did. So fast forward to February, early February 2016, uh, Desert Hot Springs City Council did approve a one-year pilot program for DVD to go out and start collecting all of this illegally dumped material. Stuff that's been accumulating for a long time, to map out dump sites, and uh, that's what we did. Uh, a few weeks later, we commenced the program. Uh, two guys in a flatbed truck, five days a week, eight hours a day. First thing you do is start concentrate Palm Drive. That's the first thing we want to do. Just start take care of Palm Drive, major roadways, move on to vacant lots, alleyways. Um, of course, uh, you see the equipment there. It's one big flatbed truck. I'm sure you've seen it. it's a big yellow truck, which all did uh, uh, Big Bird. I'm sure everyone's seen it. It's been all over the place. Um, we do. We did a co uh, commandeer one of our reloading trucks on several of these sites because there was so there was so much waste on it that picking it up, taking the flatbed, dumping it, it proved to be a little hard. And so we wanted to catch up with it. So we used a reloading truck. It's got a compactor, so we could do 10 tons in it. So that got us caught up really quick on some of these bigger dump sites. Uh, you see right there, uh, type of waste consisting of uh, bulky items, household, and tires. Tires, I, I, I don't know where these things come from, but I've never seen so many tires. Okay, I'm going to get in some pictures now just to kind of show the challenges. We all know what we're, what we're looking at, what we're faced with, but uh, it's always nice to see the pictures, really get the idea of just how bad some of these places are. Um, you see Big Bird there in the background, type of waste you see, I mean, it's just everything you can imagine. Well, let's go back to this one. This one right here is is an extreme example. Um, you know, they're not all like this, but this one, I, I felt it was imp important to show this one here because it just showed a lack of care. I mean, this was in a residential neighborhood. This was a duplex or a triplex next to it with a fence around it. It looked like they cleaned it up and just dumped it right over the fence, uh, which just shows a complete lack of care. Um, so this one took a while to clean up, but that is one of those extre extreme examples. And I literally have hundreds of these pictures for the first 30 days of this program. Um, this is another, these are all the popular sites. Commercial parking lots with the enclosures in the back. Uh, it's a popular place for dump material. Uh, and, and this is a big reason why we're here today too and how we got this far is you see Palm Drive in the background. 
this particular site, I think, has been a point of cleanup for several times, several times. The same spot, and it seems like the next week there's something else there. Um, again, popular spots, the uh, back of commercial buildings and, and just easily accessible in the middle of the desert. I mean, you name it, that's where this stuff is, in the middle of neighborhoods, all over the place. Car parts, um, again, these are just several uh, sites. Tires, I just want to show a couple of pictures of tires because it seems like every stop we make, there are tires. Tires here, tires there, tires everywhere. Um, all right, so I have hundreds of those pictures, but you get the idea. Um, that is Gonzalo on the left-hand side and his brother Daniel. Uh, I wanted to have a picture of them because those are the two guys that are out there picking all this stuff up. Uh, they're doing a heck of a job. The, everything they see, they're out there getting, and big birds there in the background you see. So I just wanted to go through some of the same sites. Palm Drive, this is what it's gonna look like now, and hopefully every day you go down Palm, you're not seeing any kind of illegal dumping or large bulky items. Uh, they're taking particular care, they got rakes out there, clean up as much as they can to make it look as nice as possible. Um, so you see here, middle of the desert, uh, they've mapped out a lot of these sites because it seems like the next week there's some more there. Um, so we just hope that they get tired of They're dumping it. the truck and dumping it out of the <laughs> Yeah, from one spot to the next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all busy. We yeah, dumped it you know, and we picked it up. Job security. You know, you got to keep that going. Feel um, free to ask questions as you guys feel. I absolutely. Do, I yeah. do have one. On, so you're taking actual pictures of the sites and mapping where they're dumping. Yes. So if and when we're able to put together a special enforcement team or code more code enforcement, then we could get to a point of citations if we actually have some sort of enforcement behind it absolutely okay. we have sites we have addresses we we're documenting everything that we do i know there was a about i was elected in 2007 uh, the county had a very aggressive code enforcement program at the time it fizzled out after a while but we had a lot of issues in and around the city with mm -hmm. dumping and they actually stuck these uh rock they called them rock cameras it looked like a rock and it was a really? camera and they would stick them in these areas where they were continuously having to pick up trash to catch license plates and mm -hmm. people dumping so something i think the council needs to think about in the future what we're saying yeah. rocket cameras no rock cameras yeah, yeah, it looked like, like a rock, rock and yeah, it's a camera yeah. it's like those hunting cameras they put yeah, trees exactly. and watch them. yeah that's exactly. a good another good way of, i've seen a few pictures of uh People have been shaming these people on uh, Desert Hot Springs neighborhood group as too. I've seen a few pictures of these people that were caught dumping, took pictures of them, put it on there. So it's another way of catching some of these people too because it's pretty rampant. Um, but they are catching up with it. Uh, I'm, I hope that uh, everyone is noticing that you see a lot of this dumping gone and if Absolutely. you do see something good, good. Um, just a few more after pictures just to show cleaning up behind the walls, just getting everything they can, everything they see. So first 30, uh, 30 days, February 29th through March 31st, one month, 90,000 pounds of illegally dumped waste. 700 tires, over seven, I, mean, I think we're over 1,000 right now. I mean, it's just the tires. Countless pieces of e-waste uh, appliances, and we found a few sites that have hazardous waste, big piles of paint, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we call the county for. They have a department specifically for that. Um, but uh, they've been doing a great job, and it is noticed. I, I did want to go over some of the program details. Um, One-year pilot program. Um, so this will go through February of 2017, and I'm again documenting everything I see so that at the end of the year I'm going to come back here and we'll go through if there's any peaks or valleys or uh, we'll see how it goes. I, I'm guessing and I'm hoping that once we get caught up with all this it stays pretty flat and our guys can kind of keep caught up with it and it doesn't um, escalate. Um, our quarterly newsletters just went out and now residents have this email that they can report trash at desertvalleydisposal.com I have several of the uh, newsletters back there, but it's the first thing you see on our newsletter. We encourage people to use it, anybody, in council, uh, code enforcement, police, anybody. Just let us know. Um, we'd like, we also have the phone numbers. You can call our offices, too. Um, and we'd like it to work much like your, your uh, graffiti removal program, where 24 hours, it's gone. You don't see it again. Um, what the crews are going to do every every morning, what they do is they go up Palm Drive. That's the f the main thing they do first. They look both sides, make sure there's nothing there. Then they move on to the work orders and all of the reports they got. They handle that, 
After that, they go to the regular pickup day. So if your pickup day is Monday, you're probably going to see the truck driving up and down, looking at alleyways, looking at vacant lots, trying to find all that legal dumping. Um, this was uh, a new one here too, is, is we can't collect anything from homeless encampments. That, that is a legal issue, so I think it has to go through the proper uh, procedures before we can do something like that. Um, and we don't want the program to be confused with special halls or quarterly cleanups. Mm -hmm. um, these things are still responsible, the property is still responsible for that. All you have to do is call us up, let us know when it's there, prearranged, we'll come and collect it. Um, and obviously, uh, hazardous waste isn't collected either, but we have an avenue for that through uh, environmental health. County Riverside. Uh, so having said that, lastly, the program is working really well. Um, I've been out here several times, our supervisors, just to make sure, and there's, you don't really see anything in driving up and down Palm. Uh, they're getting, and we're getting dozens of, of reports from, from residents. Good. So that's good too. Um, so I'd just like to thank the residents and the council for giving us what we need to be able to handle this and, and, and get it done for you guys. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. There, there are three things I'd, I'd like to talk about a little bit, Chris. Yeah. Are they working Monday through Friday, Friday yes. now? Would it be possible to maybe consider going Tuesday through Saturday? And uh, the reason I'm bringing mm -hmm. this up is that we have a significant amount of tourists that come in on the weekends. Okay. And it, it's possible that that would be a little more effective from the standpoint of keeping the, the trash out, out of their view. Um, I, I, I ha have also the, the question of homeless people mm -hmm. is, is a problem. Yeah. And even some of the pictures you had, you, you look at it and you'd think, well, is that a homeless encampment yeah. or, or what's going on there? And I, I don't know how we, we deal with that. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, how, how do you make a determination as to whether it's a homeless encampment? Well, um, actually, one of the strategies we use is that we cite the property owners as a public nuisance for um, just for tra trash and debris, and that shifts the burden to the property owner to remove those homeless encampments. But we're sort of now going in and, and grabbing this stuff. Is, is, there a, is there a method that they can use to determine? No, no, it's, you kind of do it on an ad hoc basis. If you see somebody who's, who has a, um, you know, some protective cover and they have pots and pans, mm -hmm. it's likely going to belong to them. Yeah, it's, it's been pretty obvious. There's been a couple of sites where either someone's been there or it's apparent that it's a makeshift little home. Um, our guys have been told just to stay clear that can't do it. Okay. We've had some calls on them, but we just can't go in there. But it's easy to tell. It, it really is easy to tell. Okay, as if long things as you're feeling comfortable it. with that. Yeah. And the final thing, tires is, are, are an irritation for me because that's where we started doing the cleanups with the previous mayor. We were going around. You brought big roll-offs out at that time, and we would fill a big roll-off in an hour and a half right. with tires. And well, we couldn't put tires in the roll-off. That's another whole matter. <laughs> but we, we would fill it with furniture and things like that very, very quickly. And, and my feeling with that is that that has to be something that we bring up to CVAG and some of the regional governments. We, there is no reason when someone goes and buys a new tire or even goes and gets a used tire that they shouldn't be compelled to pay a recycle fee right then and take care of it. Because what's happening is they'll, go, they'll buy tires and don't want to pay the $2 a tire or whatever it is, right. throw it in the back of their car and take it out and then just dump it. And, and I think something has to be done about that more at the source than expecting your guys to pick up a bunch of tires because it's expensive then too, isn't it, for you it's to recycle? An yeah, it is expensive. There's not a whole lot of things they can do with it, uh, with the tires, but yeah, it is expensive. A lot of these sites you see, there's a lot of tires there. You know, one may might think, me included, that some of these may be small businesses because they have a harder time getting rid of this stuff. Um, I, there's one area over here, a recycling center is closed down, and you see about a thousand tires sitting back there in the back. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're difficult to get rid of, mm -hmm. and, and that that's part of the problem. Okay, again. Well, I personally and everybody I've, I've talked to about this appreciates the program. You know, I think the results we've seen in the first month are really encouraging. Yeah. And hopefully we can continue in the future. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, jump in. Um, on the uh, makeshift homeless homes, right. lots, you, is there a reporting mechanism to our city staff? 
for city staff. Uh, there can be, yeah. It there would be nice be. so you can, you know, say, hey, we can't take care of that one, but uh, if there would be a separate list so that our employees can go to work on rectifying that because there's still an eyesore even if you can't get them. Right, okay. Um, and they, they don't know about them unless they hear about it. Um, about it. You aren't the only one that's doing cleanup. I'm just going to share a little story with you. I'm driving along uh, Mission Lakes Boulevard. I don't want to take too much time on this one, but I see two elderly women. One's carrying a fluorescent tube. The other one's carrying two fluorescent tubes, and they're walking along real sheepish, and they didn't know what they were going to do with these things. So I stopped, and I watched, and then they went, and they set them down in the vacant lot. <laughs> so I turned around, and I said, no, 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 and they picked them up and <laughs> <laughs> took them back. So there's two fluorescent it's tubes. It's contagious or something. you from picking up. <laughs> Not sure. Um, um, I had a... Um, gentleman who used to email me regularly because he had apparently one of these lots where there was just dumping all the time and every time he called and it's understandable he just was very upset angry tone right. so I don't know it was a week or two weeks ago I get an email from him and I wasn't angry at all it was like this really super upbeat and just the contrast between what I used to get and this one and it wasn't any big announcement hey great job or anything else you could just see it and he was just so happy and he was saying, he was basically pointing out another area. It wasn't the same area that he's already been complaining about. So um, you're making a big impact on, especially the people who have had one of these lots next to him that's been the area where it's been dumping all good. the time. No, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. It's, um, again, we appreciate uh, the council and the residents giving us what we need to be able to tackle the problem. So um, it's trash at desertvalleydisposal.com. That's right. And it's like everybody emails always easier than a phone call, right? It's much easier. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And and most of ours has have been the reporting ha has been through the through the uh, email. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, staff. I got a question for staff. Um, our graffiti guy can get if you take a picture on the app. It goes directly to our graffiti guy. If they take a picture of debris, could we get it directly to DVD? I believe we can. We'll have to look into that. But yeah, uh, where I want to uh, on our yes. My Desert Hot Springs app, we have an opportunity, uh, an option on there to press debris trash, take a picture of it, send it in. And so, if we could look into that, I think absolutely, that would, yes. that would take out a person in the middle and go directly to the source and they yeah. could have it on their phone. I know our graffiti guy gets it, and he sometimes covers it up within an hour of getting it, so. Okay. There, there was, yeah. Go ahead, Chief. There is a link. Is there? There is a link on the app that says junk litter debris. Perfect. So we may just be able to tie him right into it. Perfect. All right, ladies. Just that it's a great program, and I'm happy that we have it. It was definitely needed, and um, glad to see that Desert Hot Springs is getting cleaned up. And I know that we also have other um, volunteers in the community that, you know, go around and volunteer their time to clean up our city. But you know, it definitely is helpful to have an organization to help with the bigger, bulkier items. Just to keep it off of the streets. Yeah. yeah. Just to. Uh, the, the volunteers you're talking about, the DHS pickup crew is doing another cleanup this weekend. So there's gonna be five bins out on Palm, and they're gonna be doing little stuff, I'm sure. There's not a lot of bulky items out there, but they will be picking up, you know, litter that's been blown through. So they're doing that. So they're, yeah, the volunteers, it's just nonstop. There's so much volunteerism out here as far as picking up, it's, it's Paul, been great. Paul is here, you're doing it quarterly now, are you not? Yeah. And uh, just 7.15 in the morning. Um, if you can just reiterate the uh, contact information for the camera here, so if anybody. Yes, yes, to uh, report any illegal dumping, uh, it's trash at desertvalleydisposal.com. And that's for anybody who in DHS who sees any kind of illegal dumping. Um, or you can call our offices, 760-329-5030. Three zero. So please give us a call. Please take advantage of it. Um, we'll be out there every single day, five days a week, eight hours a day, cleaning this stuff up. And stop dumping your trash. You use your. You stop you dumping Put it in front trash. of your house or call Desert Valley Disposal and they'll right. get it. Um, you know, I, real quickly, if I could. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, we might as well. I mean, this month is one of our quarterly cleanups. Next week, 25th through the 29th. These are one of those times where you can put it out on the curb. You don't have to call us. Put out two, at least two bulky items out in front of your house. We'll make sure it's taken care of. Um, 
I, I would like to see what that number looks like after all this illegal dumping's been taken care of. I'm hoping it's a smaller number, but please take advantage of it. The other thing is the semi-annual shredding and e-waste event. That's the Saturday following April 30th from 8 a.m. to noon right here at Carl May Community Center parking lot. All you got to do, I've used this, I just want to reiterate this to the public. If you put it in the back of your car, they'll actually, you pop your trunk, they'll come over, they'll grab it out of your trunk. Anything with a plug on it, or if you've got boxes of old documents that need to be shredded, it's free of charge, it's part of their contract, just pull up here, right back here, and they will just guide you and take it right out of your car. That's right, that's right. And this last, uh, last April, we've had over 100 visitors, so it's doubling in size. That's what we want to see. People are taking advantage <laughs> of it. So. Thank you very much. Thank you for everything you guys are doing for us, Chris. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. We, we had one more presentation tonight, but we just got word that that person's not gonna be able to make it till May 3rd. Uh, the proclamation is for the Harvey Milk Day, and so we will uh, give this proclamation on May 3rd. I apologize to anybody that came out for that. Uh, but with that said, we're gonna recess till six o'clock for the general meeting. All right, if everybody can find their seats, we're going to get the regular session started here. All right, this is the City of Desert Hot Springs regular meeting of the City Council, and the City Council is serving as a successor agency to the Redevelopment Agency Board for April 19th, 2016. This is a 6 p.m. regular session. Roll call, please. Councilmember Betts? Present. Councilmember Parks? Council Member Zavala? Present. Mayor Pro Tem McKee? Present. Mayor Menace? Present. And we're going to have the invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Our Pledge of Allegiance will be given by Councilwoman Parks tonight. Our invocation is going to be given by Very Re Reverend Dennis Legaspi of St. Elizabeth Church. Please stand. God of justice and mercy, thank you for the gift of life and the opportunity to serve the people of our city. Help us to act with character and conviction. Help us to listen with understanding and goodwill. Help us to speak with charity and restraint. Give us a spirit of service. Remind us that we are stewards of your authority. Guide us to be the leaders your people need. Help us see the humanity and dignity of those who disagree with us and to treat all persons, no matter how weak or poor, with the reverence your creation deserves. And finally, renew us with the strength of your presence and the joy of helping to build a community worthy of the human person. We ask this as your sons and daughters, confident in your goodness and love. Amen. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. For city attorney's report on closed session. Uh, Mr. Mayor, there was no reportable action taken in closed session. Thank you. We're going to move on to the approval of the agenda. I am asking in a motion that we continue item 8 to 530. Staff uh, has some inconsistencies with the motion that was made, and they're going to fix that for the next meeting. Also, I'm asking that we add an urgency item 8A as in Apple. Um, it's a Homeland Security grant that was brought to our attention yesterday, Chief. Yes, sir. And with that, it uh, has a time sensitive date and we will not be able to get it in if we don't approve a certain part of it. So Chief Dale Mondari will be giving a report on that. No tank. No tank, no. No tank? No tank. Good. No tank. And then is there anybody who would like to pull anything from the consent calendar? Nothing. Um, my motion is as stated on the... Uh, second. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, I will open for discussion in just a second. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Yes. Mr. Betts. Item 8, I have some uh, comments relative to this agenda item, actually some discussion. I think it would provide some um, guidance to staff as they go forward. And I think rather than just uh, 
pull this thing from the agenda that I'm certainly uh, amicable to uh, continuing it, but I do think we should have some brief, very brief uh, discussion on this item. So I'm still asking for it to be uh, pulled. I, I think you can make your comments directly to staff. I I'm, I'm don't want to beat a no, dead actually, horse at this I, point. No, so. it's, it's not comments to staff. It's comments to fellow council members. I think the council will benefit from uh, well, uh, some discussion on this item. I'm asking we not go through this exercise I today got and that. let's I saw your motion. Yep. So I would add, I'd encourage my council members to vote no on this motion and to not forestall conversation on item eight. Any other comments? All right, please vote. <laughs> Mr. City Clerk. Motion passes with Councilmember Betts opposed. All right, we'll move on to public comments at this time. At this time, pursuant to the Brown Act, any persons may comment on matters of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City Council not listed on the agenda. Under the Brown Act, the City Council shall not take action on or discuss matters raised during the public comment portion. So basically, if you have an item that you want to speak on that's not on the agenda, you may speak during public comment. I will. There are blue, there are blue cards in the back. Please fill those out and give them to the clerk. Under any other items, you do not have to fill out these blue cards. You will be called upon as the public to speak during public comments. We'll be limited to 10 speakers or the, uh, at first at three minutes each. Um, you, it's your responsibility to watch the uh, large screens behind us and watch your three minute time period. And then uh, the council expects to maintain professional de courteous decorum during the public comments. Our first speaker is Michael Burke followed by Dave Nunn. Good evening, honorable mayor, hardworking city council, hardworking staff, members of the public, and those viewing at home. My name is Michael Burke. I am the owner of Burke Media Productions, very involved in the community as well, and I have a couple questions for all of you, including those viewing at home. Can marijuana reinvent the face of Desert Hot Springs? What is Desert Hot Springs doing different than other cities concerning medical marijuana? And how are we potentially leading the way in California with our cultivation facilities? How much revenue can it bring to the city? What are the health benefits of medical marijuana? And most important, importantly, is this business safe right here in our community? These questions can be answered with many more, including those members of the public can ask at our Desert Hot Springs Healthy Cities Initiative Town Hall Medical Cannabis Educational Forum. This is with uh, the first event that our Healthy Cities Initiative is doing open to the public with our chair, Jackie Chapman. It's being uh, co-sponsored with the Coachella Valley Cultivators Association, um, including Jason L. Sasser, one of the owners of the Cultivators Association. He will be here. We will also have our honorable mayor and our fantastic uh, mayor pro tem, Joe McKee, potentially, and, and are always paying attention to detail, Russell Betts, and then the best smiles this side of the 10, Councilwoman Yvonne Parks and Annie Ellie Zavala will of course be there. We also uh, can be expecting a short video presentation from our police chief, Del Mondary, and there in person will be uh, Martine Magana, including many of the cultivators and dispensary owners. Uh, if you cannot make it, it will be live at dhshealthycities.com, thanks to Burke Media Productions. You can also tune in later and watch the event. This is all going on tomorrow, April 20th. No joke, 420. It's at 6 p.m. and munchies will be provided. I'll see you all there. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Dave Nunn followed by Michael Bacardi. Back to follow. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council, staff. My name is Dave Nunn, and I am the former chairman of the Emergency Preparedness Search Committee, and I'm still a committee member. Last week's three earthquakes in three days, ranging from 6.2 to 7.8 magnitude, killed over 450 people. There's been a lot of social media since last Thursday about earthquakes, and I felt now is an appropriate time for your Desert Hot Springs Emergency Preparedness CERT Committee to talk about what we are trying to do for this community. How often do earthquakes of this power occur? Quakes with a magnitude of 7.0 to 7.9 occur about 15 times a year, according to the information collected by the United States Geological Survey over the decades. The bigger ones, magnitude eight and over, happen about once a year. That is worldwide. Ring of fire. Both quakes occurred 
in this horseshoe shaped area, the geographic, the National Geographic Society defines as the string of volcanoes and sites of seismic activity or earthquakes around the edges of the Pacific Ocean, known as the Ring of Fire. A large majority of the world's earthquakes, about 90%, occur in the Ring of Fire per the National Geographic Society. Are we ready for earthquakes? Are you aware? Your Desert Hot Springs Emergency Preparedness CERT Committee has valuable information for every citizen in Desert Hot Springs on how you can prepare yourself for natural disasters. Some of the topics that we discuss are mental preparedness, identifying potential hazards, hazards in your home, office building, outside, and also in your car. Create a disaster preparedness plan. Have a disaster supply kit. Financial preparedness. And in conclusion, it is important for every resident and employer to attend the free quarterly emergency preparedness CERT committee meetings held for the community. Learn how to prepare for an emergency and how to help others in your community or your place of business. Our next meeting will be Thursday, May 26th at 6.30 p.m. Location, Christ Lutheran Church at 64565 Pearson Boulevard, Desert Hot Springs. Don't be a victim. Be prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nunn. Michael Pucardi followed by Bob Terry. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Mayor, Council, staff. My name is Mike Picardi. Um, I just have a few um, announcements about events that are going on in the city. Uh, first, this Thursday, the day after tomorrow, April 21st, the Friends of the Desert Hot Springs Library continue the Meet Your Local Author series. This one could not be any more local as it's presented by an esteemed panel from the Desert Hot Springs Historical Society, Images of America, Desert Hot Springs. This lively discussion will focus on our city and its colorful history. It begins at 6 p.m. right here in the call May, and there'll be a uh, panel discussion, uh, which should prove to be pretty lively, judging by the people who are listed on the uh, flyer. Uh, the second uh, announcement has to do with the classical music series, which continues again this Sunday. There's a major change. The time is at 6 o'clock. They normally were at 4. This one is at 6. Uh, this is taking place, of course, at the uh, Christ Lutheran Church, 64565 Pearson Boulevard. This concert features harpist Jane Fergus for, sorry, Ferruzio. Originally from Germany, she is now in high demand as a versatile and dedicated performer and educator throughout Southern California. Her concert will feature pieces from each major area of Western music in harp literature, all centered on the theme of spring. Uh, admission for this is free due to the underwriting from the Desert Hot Springs CCAC and support of local businesses including Top Shop, Top Shop Cabot's Pebble Museum, Benstein McGraw Heating and Air Conditioning, Desert Valley Disposal, Burke Media, and Southern Cal Pianos. Audience members are encouraged to bring non-perishable food items for food now and donations can also be given to benefit the church's community mission projects. Again, this is this Sunday, the 24th, and it is at 6 o'clock at the uh, church. The last thing on my list is the uh, Historical Society's Soup Supper. This is one of their major fundraisers. Um, feature presentation at this will be The Vortex Revealed by Mitch Crazier. Uh, this takes place on Thursday, April 28th, so it's a week from this coming Thursday, and it's at the Miracle Springs Resort from 6 to 8. Uh, PM. Donations are $15 for members, $20 for non-members, and there's a phone number to contact for more information, 760-835-4576. Uh, this runs from 6 to 8 p.m. and should prove to be an interesting presentation by Mitch, who is known as a desert adventure guide. Uh, come and share the many wonders of our beautiful desert and see how we as human beings relate to the vortex. Thank you all for your time, and come and enjoy these events. Thank you, Michael. Bob Terry, followed by Everett English. Good evening. Uh, Bob Terry, A Better Community of Desert Hot Springs. Uh, I'm here to let the community know that we, our better community is working on three petitions right now. We want you guys to know what they are, what they're about. 
Uh, first one is we're trying to get COD, College of the Desert, to bring a campus to Desert Hot Springs. Been working on this for a while and uh, haven't been able to to get it done, so we're going to the people. We want to go with names with uh, uh, to show that we had the people behind us for this effort. Uh, College of the Desert has wasted a lot of time and $5.8 million to try and bring the new campus to Palm Springs, where they do not have the property lined up, where uh, the seller of the property is asking outrageous uh, amount that they won't even pay. And Desert Hot Springs has been offering location for a while. So we say this is long enough. Uh, let's do it. Let's do it now. Let's do it here. So you'll see us with this petition. Uh, then we also are working with uh, College of the Desert to try to get them to have an environmental studies program, uh, partially to educate the students of, about the environment, uh, specifically here in the desert, but uh, we also want them to focus on getting green jobs for their students, because they're out there if you're qualified for them. And our third petition, many of you saw me with this at, at the State of the City. Uh, we're trying to get the county who is asking for uh, state Proposition 47 savings uh, to build more jails. We want that to be used for other purposes other than built jails. Specifically, we would like it to be used for mental health purposes for people that are in and out of jails. Uh, county just spent 300 million on the jail in Indio, expanding that. It's time to stop jail expansion and spend that for more positive purposes. Thank you. Oh, uh, if uh, anybody wants copies of these petitions, want to help help us gather signatures, uh, email betterdhs at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Terry. Um, Everett English, followed by Umberto. Bagnara? Umberto, did I get that right? Yes. Okay, I always seem to mess that up for some reason. It seems so easy. Mr. English. Good evening, Council. My name is Everett English. I've been here since uh, December of 14. I moved here from Salton City. Uh, in February, my car was stolen and uh, it was immediately found. Uh, it was reported. Uh, he, the guy couldn't start it because the battery was dead. And uh, when the uh, police officer came up to the, uh, uh, where I live at the uh, Waldorf Manor, a well-known place around here, I suppose, uh, he immediately recognized the suspect as somebody he'd arrested a few times as some of the other officers. Uh, when I went back a few weeks later or a week later, I was told that uh, the, it had been sent to the uh, DAs and they can't arrest this kid until the DA gives him permission. That took six months and in the meantime, he committed six more crimes, okay? Uh, that was on video camera. Uh, my second problem was I was assaulted by a neighbor on video camera again, the police officers came and then they tried to talk me out of uh, uh, filing a charge against him. They said, well, he can file against you. You'll both go to jail. And I said, if that's what it takes, go for it. They ended up just leaving and it wasn't reported. I had to refile that one and uh, give them uh, again the copy of the video. Uh, in both cases, I was told it was a lot low priority incident, okay? Then the third incident was uh, getting my bike stolen off the bus, again with a video camera from the bus company. I reported that immediately uh, when I got home uh, and uh, sent pictures to the uh, police officer who, is, uh, who took the case or took the report, excuse me, took the report and uh, never heard back even though I left phone numbers and again I was told it was a low priority whenever I'd go in there. I can see why it's a low priority. You don't have much of a police department here because you guys are not going to raise taxes to uh, support a proper police department. I'm sure the police department here is just as frustrated if not more so because they have to deal with this on a daily basis. But 
You've got more crime up here than I've seen anywhere, and you can see it every morning on TV. Another thing that happens is that every, every, almost every week, somebody gets run over there on Palm Drive. I know how hard it is to cross Palm because I have crossed at crosswalks, and you get you try and cross that uh, that street and you're gonna get run over, even in a crosswalk. You don't have any markings, you don't have anything to, to, to show that it's a crosswalk. You don't have police cars going up and down the street to, to control traffic. You need police up here, and why aren't you doing something about it? Now, I know, you know people like low taxes, but you've gotta emphasize that we need a better police department. Thank you, Mr. English. That's your three months. Thank you, or your three uh, minutes. Uh, Thank I you still very had it. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Humberto Bagnara, and followed by Jeff Horton. Does that prove that people want taxes up so we can have a. Thank you very much for your comments. Good evening, Council. Um, I'm here this evening because I received a notice um, from the city saying something about uh, proposed ordinance prohibiting cash at the medical marijuana facilities. I just wanted to make a couple brief comments. One, Cathedral City tried that and had to change the ordinance back and let them take cash because they virtually put the people that were under those constraints out of business. Um, and I'm just curious, why would we make it any harder for a patient than we have to? When you go to that type of machine, you add two to 5% cost on top of everything. Who ultimately is gonna pay is the consumer or the patient. So you have to consider you're adding at least, more than likely, two to 5%, okay? Um, I know, because I just ordered the POS system for our store, and I just invested $7,000. So if we add this machine, that makes the POS system almost uh, useless because the way those machines work you have a, a screen you have a list have items they pick it put their money in get a little card out well then you don't need the POS system that the seed to sale system which we bought so you guys can track it all from inventory from the moment it comes in to the moment it goes out so like I said that would be at $7,000 cost a waste of money on my part um, and I'm kind of confused, how can we not take legal tender? Um, it's accepted everywhere in the world, why all of a sudden it's not accepted in Desert Hot Springs? I don't understand that. So maybe you guys can fill me in. Liquor stores, grocery stores, everybody else doesn't have to do this. Why this particular industry are we putting this, this issue on? And as far as my regu regulatory permit, under 5.5.080, .5 additional terms and conditions. Based on the information set forth in the application, the city manager or designee may impose reasonable terms and conditions on a proposed operation of medical marijuana in addition to those sp specified in this chapter. Well, I don't believe this is reasonable. Like I said, on top of spending $7,000 to try to make everybody happy to begin with, that it'd be a waste. So that's all I have to say. Thank I appreciate you. your comments. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Jeff Horton, followed by Nicole Salisbury. Mayor, staff, I'm Jeff Horton, residents here at Desert Hot Springs, uh, Veterans Chairman Committee, as well as a uh, quartermaster down at the VFW uh, post 1534. Uh, the reason I'm talking tonight, just to reiterate that Memorial Day is coming fast upon us. Uh, we're trying to have a good festivity for that. Uh, we're working a bridge with the VFW post 1534 to be able to have an after party basically, or an event, uh, instead of what we normally did every year, uh, having free food uh, located at the park. We want to bring the community down to a VFW post to be able to meet and greet with a veteran, uh, to hear stories as well as to build camaraderie and cohesion uh, within the community itself. Uh, the Memorial Day event also um, looking for a pastor as well as a guest speaker because I'm trying to keep within the community uh, local people because this is Desert Hot Springs. We have plenty of veterans. Uh, we have plenty of churches here that could benefit uh, by talking to the citizens of Desert Hot Springs. We're trying to keep that within the community. 
Uh, so if anybody has any of that information, they can contact me at 760-671-7800 uh, to let me know if they have a fellow veteran that would like to be a guest speaker or a pastor that would like to uh, be able to do the prayer uh, for the starting of the event. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for what you're doing for our community. Nicole Salisbury is our last speaker. If you want to speak in public comments on items not on the agenda, this is your time. Just need to come up to the city clerk and let that person know. David, I know you have something to say. Hello, everybody. I'm Nicole Salisbury. I'm one of the owners at Green Pro Organics, a medical marijuana dispensary in the Mission Lakes Marketplace. Um, mine is short and sweet. One, I apologize to Chief Mondary for my staff unavoidably hitting the panic button the other day. <laughs> But I greatly, greatly appreciate your department's timely response in ensuring that we were actually really safe in the building. Um, my staff felt really great about it. They were actually, not that they were happy that they hit it, but they were actually really happy that your team did a fully thorough um, you know, walk through the building and making sure that we were actually safe. So it makes me really happy to be here. Thank you. That's it. That's it? That's it. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> Thank you. David. Come forth. I know you want to talk about your event. Just come forth. Don't worry about the cards. Just come forth. You can fill it out afterwards. Hello. Don't be shy. everybody. How are you? I think I know most of you. Some of you haven't met yet. Um, I'm David Felma with Mission Outreach Project, God's mm -hmm. Kitchen and Clothing Center. Um, we serve two times a week out of the Henry Lozano Community Center in Guy Tedesco Park. We hand out free meals, food bags, free clothing, hygiene packets to homeless, less fortunate, simply just serve lunch to even people that are just lonely and need a friend for the day. Um, we are very thankful to be in the community center and with the help of our wonderful city manager here and our mayor, we were able to get some funds so that we could pay for our time there at the community center, so we're very thankful for that. Um, we are doing a fundraiser Sunday, May the 15th at the park. Um, that fundraiser is going to include a lot of activities, some music, we're going to have a Velcro wall. The kids can put on a Velcro suit or the adults and you jump and stick yourself to a wall. Um, we're gonna have sumo wrestling. Two people put on these huge sumo suits and you can wrestle it out. So maybe if any one of the councils that you know aren't agreeing on something, you guys can put on the wrestle, wrestling suits. We're also gonna have a dunk tank, which our mayor, I asked all the council people, well I didn't ask Yvonne. I didn't wanna put her in the dunk tank, but um, I, our wonderful, I don't know where he went, our police chief has agreed to go in it, our mayor has agreed to go in it. So for a dollar, you can throw three shots and try to dunk your local mayor or police chief. Um, we also are gonna have an obstacle course. It's a big blow up obstacle course. A um, lot of informational booths, activity booths. Um, we got some sponsorship money from IEHP and from um, Sentinel Power Plant the local power plant here, we got some sponsorship money from them too. So, so far we're doing good on getting this all paid for. We're keeping the cost down to a dollar for everything, a dollar for a hot dog, dollar for a soda, dollar for chips, a dollar for each activity. So we're trying to make it very affordable so that everybody can come out and enjoy themselves. But I will leave some flyers out here in front. Um, I did apply for a permit, which that guy over there is working on for me. Thank you very much. And um, you know, we have our liability insurance, our health permit and all that squared away. So. We're looking forward to this day, and please come out and support us. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. David, what time does that start? It's from noon to one, Sunday, May the 15th. Thanks, May 15th, noon to one. Crystal, uh, noon to f noon to what, David? David? One. Noon to what? Noon to uh, five. Five. <laughs> noon to five, guys. Crystal, uh, uh, Hope, I know there was a mix up on that. I was trying to get you on the schedule and I wasn't able to do that till next meeting. Or did you want to say a few words on your program uh, and then we'll have the longer presentation next meeting? Yeah, a couple. Yeah, if you have, you have three minutes if you want to say a couple things on your program. You'll have three minutes, it's on the okay. board. Hi, my name is Hope Scott. 
Crystal Johnson. <laughs> and we're a part of the CCAC. It's a club, it's a Christian Creative Art Club here in Desert Hot Springs. I actually started it in my own home. Um, I started off with 10 lovely children and then it just grew. It, you know, kids tell kids and kids tell to kids. What it is is a mentoring art program, not just art, arts we, with an S. That means it's got culinary arts, it's got um, Dance. Fine arts, dance. It has um, music. music production, drama. All these is for our, our at risk children to, and we have mentors that come and talk to them once a month. We have people that, um, special guests that come and talk to them once a month to, to try to bring out what the negativities about their lives and make it into a positive about their life. Make it creative. You take a creative mind and you take these hands and you take a heart. You create a beautiful picture. You can create a recipe. You can create a dance. You can create a whole lot of stuff if, if their minds and their heart is in the right places. I know a lot of children come from bad backgrounds. They're either gang activities or they're either uh, drug addicts or alcoholics or their family are or, or they're just Families that work a lot and don't have time, the correct time for their children. We take these children in. We have outgrown my poor house. <laughs> my husband's like, okay, we need a building. So I've been asking the mayor. The mayor's been graciously working with me to try to get us a building and, and uh, at least a temporary building until we outgrow that. We are going to outgrow these buildings until we get to our last final, I call it the best foundation it is, whatever that is. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> All right, thanks guys, sorry about the mix up. I'll make sure you're on the presentation next month. Final call, any public comments? Final call, last call. All right, public comments are closed. We are gonna move on to uh, city manager's report. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem's members of the council. Just a couple of things. Um, on this last Saturday, I played in the Elks golf tournament, and um, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I played with the mayor, and we sponsored a couple of Marines that played. Actually, one got taken away to go play with some club members, and we ended up <laughs> playing with just one Marine. But nonetheless, we did sponsor two, and uh, it's always it's always fun to get to know those Marines and what they do for our country. Um, uh, we had a great time. We had a guy who just had us laughing every hole. Um, great guy, great company, and uh, we had a good time. Um, just to give the council an update, I continue to meet with uh, applicants of cultivation, some that probably the council hasn't even known about yet. And um, I try to do my best to bring in Nathan as much as possible because it, eventually they will be handed off to him and, and Craig. Um, but there's uh, probably in the last week I've probably met with three or four more um, that would be coming forth uh, to the council at some point in time for development agreements. Uh, I'm continuing to work to hire a project manager. I've interviewed up to four people already and um, trying to coordinate with Arden uh, Wallam at the Water District to see if we can come to an agreeable solution to picking one and moving forward with that. So. Um, uh, that's all I have, so I'll just update the council as we move forward. Any other department heads? Mr. Porras. Thank you. <coughs> Mayor Council, so just want to give you guys an update on a construction project that's about to start, the STP Slurry Project, the one that goes from uh, uh, along Hacienda Avenue from Palm to Miracle Hill and from Avenida La Vista to Long Canyon Road. This project was awarded a couple months ago to All American Asphalt. It will begin this week with mobilization and some weed abatement. And the slurry seal is actually gonna start the week of May 9th, and the project should be completed by June 13th. Um, notices are actually going out this week to all the residents and businesses in the area. We will have no complete road closures, but we will have a, a couple of temporary lane closures while they do the slurry seal. And some parking will be limited. Uh, we will post up signs, so I just ask everybody to be careful. And if you guys have any questions, go ahead and give me a call at 760-329. Uh, 6411 extension 216. Thank you. And Danny, Danny, you also uh, posted that, or Nate, you posted it. Uh, yeah, I went ahead and uh, posted the uh, information that uh, Danny just uh, informed council of on the Desert Hot Springs Neighborhood Group and also the Desert Hot Springs Rant and Rave. Thank you. Mr. Mr. City Mayor, Attorney? Would you like me to comment about the burnt out structures? Yes, please do. 
Well, just the, uh, the mayor and the city council has made it very clear to my office and the code enforcement to uh, make these burnt out structures a priority in town and meaning that we should get them secured right away, screened and taken down. Um, so the, here's how the process works. We get a report, report goes to code. Well, it comes from fire, obviously the fire you know, notifies everybody that there's a fire. Gets to code, code goes out and inspects the property. If there's an immediate danger of that property collapsing, then it's likely that we can get a court order to have that property taken down immediately. We had started putting up fences, having fences put up right away. Um, unfortunately, somebody's fence was stolen but um, we're focusing on trying to get these fences put up right away. And we discovered in some of these places that, um, that have been burnt out for a while that there's transients in them. And so when we discover transients in them, we will notify the police department that they're in there and we, will, we want them to be removed for safety purposes. So we're trying to stay on, stay on top of all these fires and I encourage you all to report to the city any fire damage structures in your community that we may not know about, but the mayor and the council has made it a priority. Can you talk a little bit about the old revivals building? I know we're waiting on one permit, correct? Oh yeah, the revivals building, um, we have ordered that the revivals building be um, demolished and the property owner has agreed to do that. Unfortunately, um, the, property, the, the contractor that's been hired by the property owner needs one permit and that one permit is from the Air Quality Management District for PM10. And so our office is called there to see if there's anything we can do to get that one permit issued. So we're working. So we have hard. a cooperative property owner in that case. So we know the process doesn't seem fast enough for most people, but we are in the process, and we're it, we're the city is not holding the process up at this time, but they'll be working fast on that. Any other updates from staff? I see none. We'll move on to council member, member, mayor and council member comments. Mr. Betts. Thank you. Um, we had a budget discussion here um, in the study session before the um, meeting. It's just the start of the process, but um, um, you know, we got out of some tough budget times and now we're looking at some projections. Staff uh, made the first stab at it. We had, um, I think a resolve that we're not going to go into deficit spending, but we still have some some challenges there. Uh, the first numbers we got showed a $600,000 deficit in the next year and a $700,000 additional deficit after that, whittling down the reserves that we had built up. So I only say that just to make sure that the uh, two things, one that, you know, you, you have a tendency once you go through trouble and get out of it, you know, get out of the crisis that you, you go back to doing the same thing you did before and we're not there yet. You know, we, have, we, we I think this council hit a home run, did a perfect job of getting us through that crisis and we've got to keep doing a perfect job and the, the public has to understand there is not unlimited resources up here at this, uh, at, the, at the city. Uh, I was real happy to hear from the rest of the council members that they too are resolved that we're not going to go into deficit spending. So that's that's the good news. The uh, challenge is between now and June 30th is to make everything work. So it's not a big catastrophe financial announcement I'm making. It's just that's reality and we're working towards it and I'm certain that we will have a very good positive financial outlook after we do some more work up here. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, there was one item um, and I know you council spent a lot of time on it in closed session. I had to recuse uh, because I had a what I felt was a, a good reason to recuse. It was, turned out I didn't need to, but I did. So I didn't participate in the discussion. It had to deal with Palm Investment Group. So since I wasn't in those meetings, I've been anxiously waiting for that to get reported out. Will we, is that resolved now? Was well, there some point in time when we're going to get reporting out on what the result of that item was? Um, actually, that's being handled by outside counsel. Um, I can, at the next meeting, I can catch up where, with where they are to see if there's anything we must report. Okay, if you, I think if we took any action or there's any settlement of anything out of closed right. session that it must be reported out. Right. And the only reason I happen well, to be in yeah. tune with this is I've been anxious to waiting. So if you could check with right. whoever that other council was, right. it's not, not your firm, it's another firm that we contract mm -hmm. with, right? Correct. And get those yeah. details, that would be wonderful. 
So hopefully at the next council meeting that would happen. Um, and I've been focused in on some of these vacant homes. I've had residents contact me talking about, uh, you know, geez, there's people using my neighbor's house. They're not in town. They're just going in and using this house. Maybe the neighbor left electricity on or whatever. And, and um, so it's a residence vacant homes where squatters have gone in. And then we have other bank homes, bank owned homes, and they have those on a status of do not market status. That's the status that the bank has. So it's sitting there empty, some cases boarded up, some cases having caught on fire. Um, and we've got to do something to fix that situation. I don't know why the bank would have these properties in a do not market status. Um, they just maybe they haven't worked through the, the pile of all the homes they have or whatever. But we have people who want to come in, buy those homes, fix them up and sell them. Uh, there's a nice one up on uh, top of West Drive, second one down from the top, and it looks to be a nice, very viable property. Somebody went and tried to make an offer on it, and they were told, nope, sorry, um, nothing we can do. There's another one on Second Street, and I went and looked in the window, and the drywall's kicked in. The home looks very nice from the outside, and the bank has assigned a real estate agent to it and a property management company to it, and they're both very frustrated that the bank has this on a do not market status. There's something wrong with that. We don't want homes in our community that are sitting in a blighted state with a bank saying, well, we're not ready to do anything with this yet. You guys can just wait. That's not right. Now, we did have an ordinance in place that uh, was pretty heavy handed with the banks and the foreclosures. And um, I understand that we need to make some adjustments to that. So I'm hoping that um, get that thing brought back at the next meeting with whatever adjustments we need to make, get that on the agenda and let these banks know that if you've got a property that's sitting in a derelict condition, you're gonna get fined, you're gonna get fined every day and it's gonna be hefty, hefty fines, whatever the law will allow because you can't just sit there in your office somewhere outside the city in a high rise and leave this blight in our community. So um, I'll be looking for a council member to join me in putting that on the agenda. Uh, we have some of the basic language in place. So Mr. City Attorney, if you could uh, work with me to get that language cleaned up, I'm going to plan to bring that to the, uh, to the next uh, you council You don't need meeting. to ask for any. I will make sure it's on the, would May 3rd be enough time for you? Hmm? Will May 3rd be enough time for you? Yeah, I'll, get, like to, the May I'll get with the uh, city attorney and I'll either get together with you and Send put me it a on quick email. find another council member and get that dropped on the agenda. But again, I'll put it on the agenda. Just let me know what day you okay. need another council member. Um, the illegal fireworks in the community. It's kind of quiet now, but it wasn't last 4th of July or the week before and a week after. It was actually a war zone. If you were down by Kmart, the noise going on was so loud it was setting off car alarms and it was a problem. The community just said it was too much of a problem. And these are the illegal fireworks, the ones that go boom really loud in the sky. We had a lot of complaints. So I remember the conversation we had after that where we asked the uh, fire department, is there something that could be done to where, I know we can't stop everybody, but maybe if a few people get slapped with a thousand dollar fine, they'll start telling their friends, you know what, desert place, desert hot springs isn't the place to be blowing these things off. I just got a thousand dollar fine and there's no exception. I had to pay it and oh man, did that, my wife's upset at me. So I'd like to ask the chief, is that something that first off, the fire chief, first off, is there some ordinance that this city needs to put in place that will allow you to impose a special, or maybe the city attorney can answer this, a thousand dollar fine uh, that'll just, I don't have no illusions that we're gonna go get everybody to stop. The idea is that a few people get a thousand dollar fine and some guy actually targeting one of your guys sitting there waiting, as soon as they see it go off, they zero, swoop in and give the guy a ticket. Is that something we can work on? I know we had some kind of positive confirmation that we could work towards that with the last chief, but you know, we've had a transition here. I would like to have something in place to try and put a lid on this stuff. I would defer the question about the $1,000 fine to the city attorney. The as far as no. the <clears throat> enforcing, you know, we can work with PD, and I know Pat was, was working on some stuff, and I haven't been caught up to speed on that, but um, we do have our prevention officers. Um, I could get together with the prevention officers and find out if we can have a dedicated fire prevention officer come out on those specific nights where we have events, fireworks heavy, um, and maybe they could help us enforce that with DHS PD. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, whatever it takes for this council, I'd like the council to be in agreement that 
we'll get you a special ticket book that you know slap somebody with a thousand dollar fine so you guys can have a contest to see who writes the most tickets and uh, then maybe we could have a barbecue and benefit for the fire department or something okay so um, if we could get that one going um, okay some good news Wardman Park Pool starts operating May 20th for its official opening this summer, which is swim for <laughs> exercise for adults, swim lessons for kids, and open lap swim. Um, now, actually, there's uh, if you want to go down there on Monday, Wednesday, Friday this week, and every week before, they've already started the uh, adult exercise classes. That's Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9 a.m. But we did manage to get a $20,000 grant earmarked for Wardman Park Pool, and uh, so it looks like that'll be a, uh, another year of, this is the second year now that we've managed to keep that open, and at absolutely zero cost to the city. The, the, the steering committee that's overseeing this has made sure that uh, they met that condition that was placed by this council so it didn't cost the city any money to operate that. So uh, it's still going, and uh, of course we just concluded the uh, the water volleyball, which was a real big success. Just a quick note to Everett English, who was complaining that what seemed to be low priority calls, I can say that from talking to the chief, I get these calls coming to me as a council member. They aren't low priority to our police department. Uh, they might be overwhelmed with some of them sometimes, and, but they're, my impression is the chief takes these very seriously and, and uh, make sure that uh, his officers are taking them very seriously. Um, we do have to weigh priorities, but it's just, uh, it's, it, if there's anything that uh, anybody got the impression that our officers aren't doing what they should, that's not the case. Markings at intersections, can we get that on the agenda at some point in time? It's I coming forth from a recommendation from the Public Safety Commission. Okay, good, and so then we can get that on to like, Correct. not just as a recommendation, but it'll come through to actually authorize the spending of paint and good, because it's about it time. It won't be that, but there'll be a recommendation of Public Safety Commission on how we should move forward with it, yes. Okay, well, my, my recommendation is it's long past due that we put some markings down. Mr. English was entirely correct that we need markings at intersections. It's about, it's long past due. Um, wow, was that a kerfuffle that blew up on the internet about no cash transactions in the city of Desert Hot Springs? I don't know how that one got going. I don't, I'm not the one working on it. My my dollar bill here says this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. And I'm pretty sure every one of my council members think the same thing. So I think uh, maybe somebody else can explain what happened on that one. But I think that was just a, uh, something about a mixed message got out. And uh, I don't know how that notice got out there. But I can't imagine anybody up here would think that we would make cash illegal in Desert Hot Springs. So I, you know, I only know enough about what took place that it wasn't meant to go out there. There's nothing secret about it, but I don't think anybody is trying to make this illegal in our city. So it blew up really big, um, So and it shouldn't have. And other than that, I attended the Airport Land Use Commission, Southern California Association of Governments, and um, steering committee for the Warburn Park Pool. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. McKee. Uh, since I was the one that joined another councilman to discuss the situation with cash at the dispensaries, I'll take full responsibility for blowing up whatever blew up. Um, the, I, I think everyone understands that one of the problems with the medical marijuana industry is the fact that it's a cash industry, that banks don't deal with it and everything else. There is no way we were trying to put something in place that we didn't have a discussion with the dispensaries and didn't come up, try and come up with a uh, amiable solution. But I think it is in their interest to make sure that the IRS and other people don't come pounding in on their door dealing with the fact that it's an all cash business. And unfortunately, in the present circumstance, it's still pretty easy to shuffle one in one box and one in the other to be blunt. Uh, I, I know that there are systems in place, but we need to talk about that as a community, whether that, that system is sufficient or anything else. There, there was no intent, as far as I'm concerned, to make cash illegal. That, that in itself would be illegal. There was a methodology trying to try and ensure that the cash was, was uh, uh, handled in a way that it could be tracked, and that's all. 
So anyway, I think someone else will probably talk a little bit about that too. No, 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 you can't. Yeah, I, I understand that. If you listen to all the comments made tonight, maybe we'll give some of your, your answers to it, but there'd be a possible item in the future that you could speak to, but we can't have a back and forth. The, um, I, I visited a bunch of things. I visited Day of Young Child. I had a couple of meetings about library. The, the, both the council and members of the community, the, the friends of the library are working very hard on the, the library issue. And I think in the next few weeks we'll have something we can talk about that. Um, I attended a, at the Health and Wellness Center a wrap event for regional access project as far as behavioral um, um, medicine that's, uh, that's available to us and, and discussed quite, quite bluntly the lack of it in our community and the fact that we are excluded so many times from a lot of the programs that exist as far as behavioral medicine is concerned. Had two meetings with the art zone, the, the regular meeting with the whole crew. We have the largest committee that has ever been uh, put together, I think, in, in Desert Hot Springs as far as the uh, art zone committee. Uh, we then had a leadership me meeting after that, that uh, uh, five people attended, the, the uh, representatives from the CCAC Planning Commission, the two city council people, and uh, the person that's acting as a facilitator to try and get that back online as far as moving forward. Um, went to the State of the City event. Uh, there is a varying opinion about the State of the City event that revolves around length of time. <laughs> and, and my feeling was this. Too often we're in a position that what people want to talk about are negative things about our city. And I applaud the mayor for talking about the positive things. And, and more than that, some people were, uh, were positive about the article that, that basically appeared the next day, and I thought that they excluded a lot of stuff that, that should have been in there. So uh, again, I think it was a, a, a good event, handled very well. Speaking of good events, it's, it's very seldom that we can have really positive events. We went to the Shandi event, the mayor and I did. Um, celebrating a, a person that emigrated to our country 25 years ago and has basically become an American success story. He's, he owns, owns AMPMs, Taco Bells, Burger Kings, everything else that you can believe and, and basically started working as a clerk in a store, sleeping in the back of the store and 25 years later has made this kind of success. It was just a great event, a positive event showing that uh, that Hard work in a lot of instances can can result in positive things, and I, I was just really happy to to represent the city and be in in that event. What an event! Yeah, well, you can talk a little bit about what it was. You know, it was a stupendous. It, 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 it was sort of Indian Cirque solo as far as the entertainment and everything else. It was just amazing. Uh, I wanted mostly to talk about SCAG again because there are two things that are going on. I've talked about vehicle miles traveled until probably people around here want to throw things at me, so I'm not going to talk very much about that tonight. We've finally gotten to the bottom of, I think, the problem with housing and the way that especially federal government and local governments look at housing. I've gone to SCAG and argued we don't need to build affordable housing in Desert Hot Springs because that's all we have right now. We want to focus, if we can, on building more expensive housing. The problem is this, though. There's a difference between affordable housing and a program that can ensure people can afford that affordable housing. The reason people in a lot of cases want to get into subsidized housing, government housing, is because in those programs they only have to pay 30% of their income for housing. There aren't enough vouchers for everyone that qualifies for that. If we had a voucher program that was in place that would have that program available, the housing in Desert Hot Springs would be sufficient, I think, when it comes down to it for the people that live here. So I think over the last couple of meetings, I think I've become more clear on where the problem is and what we need to do. And more than that, I think I've been thunking people over the head at the various regional government layers uh, saying 
look, we, we are a small community. We don't fit the model that you have. We are not Los Angeles where the average home costs half a million dollars. We, we're in a position that, that people can afford housing here, except in the circumstance where let's pick a, a widowed person that was living on Social Security and making $700 or $800. I think it's $865, something like that would be what they would get from Social Security. If, if they're in a position that they have to rent a $600 studio or something like that, that puts them in a really bad position as far as being able to afford food and medicine and everything else. So what we need to do, I think, as, as government officials is, is increase the amount of money going to the voucher programs and, and make sure that the affordable housing that's built is built in areas where especially the working poor live, uh, and where the working poor work, sorry, so that we cut down on the transportation needs of them and other things. So uh, these two things, as far as I'm concerned, are, are things that both Council Member uh, Betts and I have been, taken to heart, and I think we're gonna try and work through this and put together some programs that, that make sense as far as these things are concerned. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Parks. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm sure that all of you remember when JetBlue announced that they were going to uh, offer nonstop flights from Palm Springs to JFK in New York for $99 one way. Well, that was last October, and it was on my bucket list. I'd never been to New York. So my daughter and I and my sister-in-law decided we're gonna take advantage of that JetBlue flight. And unfortunately, it just happened to be that although I made the reservations in October, Scott scheduled his state of the city the same time I was leaving uh, to fly to New York. I'm sorry I missed it. I'm sure from what I've read and heard, it was absolutely Fantastic. Very, very proud of you, Scott. Um, just a little on the trip. If you ever have a chance, Manhattan is a place to go. <laughs> um, I went up the Empire State Building, took a pedicab through Central Park. Now, I don't know. I had a, an image of Central Park with, you know, all of the rapes and a horrible place to go. It's beautiful. Got in a little pedicab, went all through Central Park. But I told him what, what my thought was on it. He says, well, this is the good half of the park. <laughs> he says, there's another half of the park that's exactly like you thought, but we don't go over there. Nobody goes over there. But anyway, what I went through was absolutely gorgeous. Dropped us off at the Plaza Hotel. It was just wonderful. Took a double-decker bus all over to every borough, over the Washington Bridge, Brooklyn Bridge, through the tunnels, through the water, um, went to Ellis Island and Statue of Liberty. It was raining, of course, so we had our plastic ponchos on with the rain coming down on us so we could at least see what we were wanting to see and pay for what we paid for. Um, we went to Ground Zero. Oh, my God. It's, you know, it, it really gets to you. There's these huge uh, water features and the museum and, and the forever tree. I don't know if you know or heard about this forever tree, but it was buried in the rubble and it survived. And it is still there in that area, thriving, beautiful flowering tree. So that was another one, the forever tree. Saw the Trump Tower. My sister-in-law got up bright and early, went to Times Square, got on the Today Show. So that was, that was her bucket list. Anyway, um, took the subway once they don't like handicapped people in Manhattan. I guess it was built so long ago that they didn't have elevators or escalators in those days. So I uh, had to walk down three flights of stairs to get to the subway and back up three flights. That was once and once. But I got on the subway and, and if I was, I wish I'd have done this trip 10 years ago where I could run and romp with the younger people. And then it would have been really, really great because it is a walking city. It's very walkable. Anyway, that was a wonderful trip. I'm glad I'm home because of the weather. My arthritis is definitely a desert, desert illness. 
Uh, our art district, uh, I think most of you have heard that we uh, have a community involvement in, a di in the art district committee, and we're working on short and long-term goals. Uh, one of the short-term goals will be discussed at the next meeting on April 25th. We're hoping to establish a pop-up facility for artists to show off their work and sell their art. Um, we want to bring people downtown um, with music and, and uh, food, and hopefully we can build on it. We, we, short term is something that starts small and we can build. The long term is actually establishing these art, art zone, um, the um, housing for artists, lofts above and, and their, their um, businesses below. But that is long term. The short term is to get them somewhere where they get, where our artists can be visible within our community. We can actually have every weekend an art show in downtown. So we're working on that. Uh, I attended the Energy and Environment Com Committee at CVAG, Coachella Valley Association of Governments, and the most important or <laughs> interesting agenda item is the Community Choice Aggregation Feasibility Study. Now, um, on January 25th, the uh, CVAG Executive Committee authorized the Executive Director to develop and issue a request for proposal or an RFP for a CCA, which is the which is a community choice aggregation um, uh, group for a feasibility either independently or in cooperation with Western Riverside County Association of Governments and San Bernardino Association of Governments, a tri-county uh, feasibility. This is where it allows cities and counties to aggregate their buying power to secure electrical energy supplies contracts on a region-wide basis in an attempt to offer competitive rates to their consumers with the option of purchasing power from greener sources. So um, pending the outcome of the feasibility study, staff will be determining the proper steps uh, to form a CCA. Uh, there will be a more information will be provided to the executive committee on April 25th. And for those of you that have thought and wondered why do we always have to stay with Edison? This is a way for the counties and the, and the, the regions to actually start their own power company. So it's, it's something that may or may not come about, but I thought it was very, very interesting that they're going as far as a feasibility study. So. I'm glad we're researching the fires. Um, I also, uh, I'm looking forward, David Fellman, to your uh, activities, and that is this Sunday, the 24th? 15th. May 15th, a good thing I didn't show up on Sunday. Okay, May 15th, noon till five at Tedesco. Um, it sounds like a wonderful event, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to being there and watching uh, our uh, chief and our mayor get dunked. <laughs> Mr. Bala. Okay, so I know we've kind of gone on a little, a little long here, it tends to happen. Um, so I'm gonna be quick. Um, so I attended the State of the City address. It was a very extravagant event, if you guys attended. I mean, it was beautiful. Um, and so the chamber did a great job in putting that together. It was very, very nice. I mean, there was the red carpet, you got champagne, goodness gracious, not still water, <laughs> but you got nice bubbly water. <laughs> so it was a great event. It did go on a little long, but. <laughs> <laughs> I did not have the champagne, <laughs> but I am old enough. <laughs> it did go on. Right on. <laughs> Maybe I should have had some. Yes, you should have. <laughs> um, I also went to the Riverside County Health Initiative meeting in Moreno Valley, which was very informative, and um, it was just basically talking about uh, the incorporation of 
you know, health elements into general plans. And I know we're going to be having an update for our general plan. So that's perhaps something that, you know, could either be incorporated into our general plan. I know we have the Our Healthy City initiative that could coincide with a health element to a general plan, or perhaps um, starting to really make a very conscious effort to incorporate, you know, that health component into the existing elements. Uh, but it was a very, very informative meeting. I also attended the Coachella Valley Conservation Commission meeting. Um, there was just a lot of talk about bighorn sheep at this past meeting. Um, <laughs> so if you love bighorn sheep, um, they're going to be spending about $100,000 on monitoring, monitoring the bighorn sheep. And that's consistent with the multiple species uh, habitat conservation plan. And uh, in case you didn't catch it, PBS did a news hour segment on the multiple species habitat conservation plan. And so they interviewed some of these Seabag, um, you know, uh, employees, and they did talk about our little desert. So it was it was nice. We got to see it there. Um, and then I also went to an education uh, committee uh, meeting uh, at the Desert Hot Springs High School, and this is about the education academy that's going to be uh, started in the fall. Uh, so that was also great. Um, I know that they are actually mentioning, for example, um, having some of the students, you know, potentially work with the Chamber of Commerce and uh, providing maybe some uh, free website design for some of their customers that can't afford it, or for maybe the small businesses that are around here. And this is really just to promote a sense of community with the students that are engaging in this education academy. Clearly, we want them to come back and be teachers here locally. Um, and then I also attended the microloan meeting and um, that went well. We set an application workshop uh, date and that's going to be on, let me look this up because I wrote down the time without the date. So that's on May 15th at the Miracle Springs at 4 p.m. And then I also attended the day of the of the young child event on Sunday, and I volunteered with the assemblyman's uh, field rep doing child fingerprinting, uh, in case um, you know student like a child ever gets lost, fingerprints are on file. So that was great. And um, and then as far as the. Uh, cash transactions and the medical marijuana dispensaries. Uh, clearly, yes, that was sent out prematurely. Uh, it is a discussion we should be having. You know, we clearly all know that, you know, this is probably going to end up on our November ballot for California. So thinking ahead, you know, I think it's, you know, Depending on how that turns out, I don't see the federal government being too keen on having cash-only uh, medical marijuana dispensaries just in terms of reporting purposes. And so I think it is a discussion that should be had. You know, how is it that we can work together, something that works for the dispensary owners, something that works for the city. Um, it, it obviously becomes, you know, very difficult to to monitor any sort of you know cash transaction, um, so yeah, let's have a discussion about it. It was obviously put on there, and uh, you know, a notice was sent out. It was premature, uh, so I think um, you know there was miscommunication there between staff and legal services. So um, no need to uh, get too concerned there, but it is a conversation that we do need to have. Like I said, it's it's important to the community. It's important and beneficial for everyone. So thank you. All right. Um, I met with the Walton Group who owns the Tuscan Hills Project and the Highland Springs Project. Uh, they were hopefully, as announced in the state of the city, going to be moving soon on a concept that they're developing on the Tuscan Hills Project for the city council to review. Um, in the next few months, um, so we'll be, that'll be coming forth. 
met with the Hoteliers Association. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem had to leave town for an event, and or uh, Skag it was that day early. So I met with the hoteliers and just gave an update on what's going on and working closely with them. We'll be assisting them on the spa tour this year and trying to build a joint effort so that everybody's involved. Met with the Ministerial Fellowship and gave an update from the city. That same night we had to stay in the city, and yes, I know it went long. I've heard that many times, uh, but it was more of a positive message that I wanted to get out there. And if you haven't had a chance to see it because you weren't able to make it, you can go to my website, which is scottmattis.com, and it is up there so you can sit there if you're bored one night for a couple hours. <laughs> I think Michael shaved off about 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> But I, I wanted to thank the city manager and the police chief for joining me in the presentation to the, to, uh, the, the citizens of our community. Desert Hot Springs is a positive place. And as much negative press as we get and negative response from some, some of the individuals in our community, it was time to hear about the positive things. And I went on for two hours and probably could have gone on for five hours talking about the positive in our community. Um, but I wanted to thank them. I wanted to thank the Chamber of Commerce uh, for putting on the event. It was it was nice. It, it seemed extravagant as mentioned, but it was uh, down to earth. Um, if you if you came in, you were welcomed. And I also wanted to thank all the sponsors, a lot of them from our community and a lot of them for partners with our community um, that they came in and helped sponsor this event. Um, it was. Uh, uh, negotiated at a very low rate, uh, but without those sponsors, it would never have happened. So thank you very much for your for your uh, participation. Uh, I met with Michael Bacardi and the Hero organization. Uh, they are a sustainable energy program that we have through our PACE program for the um, state, and uh, we're going to be working on a bigger presentation for the community here soon. Uh, as mentioned by the Mayor Pro Tem and uh, attended the Shandi event, the reason I want to speak about it is that this individual owns the AMPM at the corner of Indian and I-10. Um, he started, uh, he, he came here I believe when he was 19 or 20 years old, got off the plane from India and was driven out here from India got off the plane in LA and was driven to, driven to Indio. So he was kind of confused when he got off the plane, but once he landed here and found out where Indio was, he accepted a job, slept on a cot in the back of a uh, fuel station, and within years owned that fuel station and now owns uh, multiple fuel stations and franchises in the Coachella Valley. Um, he he invited his closest 600 friends uh, to this event, but it was very, very uh, nice and um, it was fun to celebrate with him. I did have a few minutes with him. He's looking at more investments in our community and these are the type of people we do want to invest in really, really know what it's like to start from the beginning. He owns a company that will buy property. Uh, he owns a company that has the escrow of the property. He owns a company that will construct the project and then he runs the project and does not give it away. So he goes from basically dirt to building and he runs everything. It's a fantastic uh, projects that he does for, our for the communities. Um, Riverside County Transportation Commission, I, uh, we had a regular meeting and nothing pertained to Desert Hot Springs, basically the budget and a few other items that we talked about, a lot of legal items in closed session that we had to discuss, but nothing pertaining directly to Desert Hot Springs. Tom Tucker from CBS2 interviewed me and they will be in the community interviewing others, so if you do see them in town, uh, they're going to be doing a big piece in May on the cultivation and dispensaries in our community. And then today we uh, had a phone conference with uh, myself and one of the cultivators with the Press Enterprise. Um, Erica, which is the uh, emergency, no, why am I missing the, the acronym chief? He's looking at me going, don't ask me. Eastern, Eastern Riverside Interoperability Communications Authority. Thank you for getting me started. Phew. <laughs> Uh, we had our, we had a meeting. We have about two to three meetings a year, and this is the radio system that Desert Hot Springs fo functions is on for our police services. We're in line with four other cities. Uh, we approved our budget, um, gave that to the city manager who's already worked it into the next budget. Uh, we were trying to finance the backbone, which costs the city whatever it was at the time. We still have, uh, I think, three payments, three more years of payments due, and we were trying to refinance those payments to see if we get a lower percent. We weren't able to do that, but we did get Motorola to take off a couple percents off the interest, which benefit, will benefit us in the future. Why the five cities are involved in this was because our radio systems were falling apart. The county was looking at a bigger system, which was very expensive. Our radio system actually was a lot less in price, and we have um, room on there for other government agencies, such as school districts and others that were trying to sell and put on that radio system, which would bring our cost down each year. So we're working on that. 
um, attended the Elks Club golf tournament as the, as the city manager stated. We each sponsored a Marine for that day. It's a wonderful tournament that the Elks Club puts on because they bring Marines out for free of charge to play golf. Uh, and the Marines don't like you to know this, but there's some Navy people that come out too, Joe. Um, but uh, we were with a Marine. He was very funny. He was he was a younger guy uh, out of Count Pendleton, and it was nice to play for the day with him and and hear what uh, challenges he has in life. Um, so with that said, the, this is a fundraiser for the Elks, which goes back to the community, and it was it was a fun day. Uh, that evening, uh, Don Kelly invited me over to the neighborhood watch program. Um, they had about 10 people out in their neighborhood, which is uh, just south of the of the high school, and they're continuing to push on their neighborhood watch program, which is nice uh, in that community. If you're interested in a neighborhood watch program. You can contact our police department and they'll put you in contact with uh, our coordinator and they can help you form or give you the uh, inf information to form your own neighborhood watch. Um, the Boy Scouts invited me over to speak on their community garden project. They have one scout that's getting ready to finish his or start his Eagle project and he wants to build a community garden. Um, so we'll be assisting him with that. Uh, the Economic Development Committee meeting will meet uh, next Tuesday at 6 p.m. here in the Carl May. Uh, healthy Cities uh, initiatives, um, uh, as mentioned by Council Member Zavala, uh, working the healthy portion into your general plan is important and other cities have done that. Daisy Ramirez, who is our representative from the county for the uh, uh, for the healthy issues, uh, actually lives in our community and she's working with us to help develop that so we can add that to our, um, that's my fan club out there, thank you Michael. Um, on public comments, a couple things I just want to say is sometimes uh, staff is not perfect. And with the issue with the medical marijuana and the issue that some council members wanted to bring through, it has to work through the process. Um, I wish that members that were here commenting on it would wait and hear everybody's comments because we can't comment to those individuals when they're standing up here. But concern was made throughout the community and that was important. The city attorney was doing something that he was asked to do by two council members, moving the item through the system and it, for somehow it slipped through some holes and moved a little faster than it probably should have. The notices were sent out correct if that item was to be brought back today. And that's how the information got out there. It wasn't anything wacky. It was just something that moved too fast. Um, a discussion needs to happen here at the council level, even if myself or two council members put something on here, a discussion still has to happen before any item is ever, an ordinance is developed or anything like that. So please feel, feel um, uh, uh, secure that if, if any item does come forth, you will get as the public the right to speak your mind on that issue so that you can help the council make a best decision for this community. And then lastly, my office hours, again, every Tuesday from 10 to 2 p.m. Uh, you may come at any time with no appointment necessary. And my office is located at Building C at City Hall. And I think that's it. Uh, we're gonna move on to the administrative calendar at this point. Our first item is item number six, which is a consideration of an ordinance prohibiting the retail sale of dogs and cats within the city of Desert Hot Springs subject to certain expectations. And I have added this item on request from Tiffany, Tiffany is Labu, Labu, was it, ah, God, good. Um, and this is uh, an, an item that she had been emailing me about and been leading the cause. I don't know if she's the only person leading the cause, but she's been leading the cause throughout the Coachella Valley. And I put it on as an agenda item. I will let um, uh, the city clerk, did you have anything to add to that? Did I get everything? And I'm gonna ask her to come up and speak to this item. You will have three minutes once you state your name. My name is Tiffany Labou. Thank you, Mayor, City Council, and all city officials that are here. Uh, appreciate you bringing it to the table for discussion. Um, we've been working with individual cities without, uh, throughout the Coachella Valley for the last couple of years to try and get um, a handle and get ahead of the, um, the unwanted dog and cat epidemic that is happening in Coachella Valley. And I know that your city has been very uh, forthright in uh, having the uh, mobile spay and neuter clinics. Um, it takes a village to get all these things uh, handled, but um, uh, that along with a, um, a message to the communities that um, 
that retail sales of dogs and cats in cities only adds to the unwanted pet population here. Um, we have a, a high kill shelter that's five miles away from here that euthanizes in upwards of 63% of any dogs and cats that come into the shelter for whatever reason. Um, we do not have enough humans for the amount of animals that uh, are here and so that was my hope was to um, be able to get yet another city to basically say adopt, don't shop. Um, also a backyard um, breeding ban would be a component of the retail uh, ban on dogs and cats in the city of Desert Hot Springs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We did receive a letter from Paula Terrify. Did you want to speak to your letter? As soon as you state your name, Paula, you'll have three minutes. Paula Terrify, resident, Desert Hot Springs. I want to thank you, Scott, for getting us on the agenda. I really do. Um, we need to be a progressive city. We need to follow what other cities have done. There are six other cities in Coachella Valley that have already done this. We will be number seven. That only leaves Palm Desert, which is a problematic city because they already have a pet store. And I will speak to that issue. You don't ever want one in your city. Um, I want to just draw for a moment on my um, experience with this because I used to work in veterinary hospitals and I had firsthand knowledge and un very unfortunate sad cases of sick puppies and sick kittens being brought to me on a weekly basis from pet stores. I got to the point where I had to tell consumers, even though I'm looking at your cat or your puppy or your kitten, what you just purchased. Um, even though I'm looking at it today and I'm telling you it's healthy, you have to wait seven to 10 days to make sure it doesn't become ill because within that time frame, it can be sick. And it happened more times than I'd like to tell you and I've watched puppies die from Parvo because you have to understand what these puppy meals are all about. They're putting puppies out there that are not vaccinated. You can't immunize a dog correctly until you've had a full, full series of shots starting at eight weeks. Then you repeat at nine weeks, then you repeat at 12 weeks. It's not till four months old if the immune system has been properly stimulated that that puppy can survive an insult. So I watch these puppies die. <laughs> they don't make it, some of them. And if they do, they require intensive hospitalization. And that is a cost that often the pet stores will not pay for. They, this is the standard reply. Uh, come get another puppy. Well, you know the emotional distress these people have been through? After they've fallen in love with the puppy and they've watched it be sick and they've spent thousands of dollars and they've tried to sue this pet store, it's a nightmare. Because this, is, this, isn't, this isn't like being on the farm when, you're, when, you're, when your dogs had puppies and they were out on the farm. Uh, those dogs weren't, those puppies weren't uh, exposed to all the, the um, viruses that are inherent in puppy stores. They're not cleaning those services properly. And, um, and so they're exposing, it's, it's a place like being, it's almost as bad as being at the shelter. They're exposed to everything there. And if they didn't have parvo, they had kennel cough, they had something. Um, also, these are not quality bred animals. These are not purebred animals. People are, have this false sense that they're getting some quality dog. They're not. The dog fancy, the people that show and train these dogs, uh, that you know, you see them on TV. Um, these are breeding the top line dogs, and and you're not going to ever find a dog like that in a in a pet store. These are puppy mills, and you need to move to protect the consumer because the consumer is still quite ill informed of what they're really buying when they go to the pet stores. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like to speak on this item? Yes, please come forward. State your name. Your three minutes will begin. Andrew Cerner, City of Desert Hot Springs. Thank you, Mayor, Council, and staff. I wanted to make certain that on the exceptions, we're being very clear um, of what that entails. I myself am a professional dog breeder. I've been breeding boxers for 25 years. They are AKC, UKC registered, and I am a reputable breeder. And I just want to make certain that we're making that clarification where I absolutely agree with what was spoken previously regarding puppy mills. 
regarding some of these other types of retails, but I want that distinction made of someone like myself who lives in the city of Desert Hot Springs, who does everything correctly, who is registered through AKC and UKC, and I do a litter maybe every other year versus being an actual termed puppy mill. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak to this item? Yes, ma'am, you may come forth, Nicole. State your name, your three minutes will begin. I'm Nicole. I completely agree with Ms. Terrify. I have four dogs of my own. I have probably rehomed at least 80 other dogs that I find on the street or I take from bad dog owners. Um, or, you know, like they abandon their house and then there's a dog left there. Um, so I completely agree and not that I, I don't think that there should really should be retail sale of dogs or and really cats until you can lower the amount that are already out there. There's not even enough people, like she said, to cover the amount of animals that are currently here. And if you've ever walked into a kill shelter, it's awful. It's inhumane, it's horrendous. I can't stand going there because otherwise I'll take home five more dogs and I'll probably get fined. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I really do agree, I've had four dogs. Um, all of my dogs are on some kind of medication because unfortunately people get dogs who get sick and then they let those dogs go or they don't take care of them. So I am in full support of them that until the population of the animals goes down, I don't really think you should allow any sales. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like to speak to this item? Last call, final call. All right, public comments are closed on item six. We'll go to council member comments, Mr. McKee. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I, I fully support this with the exception of some clarification as far as uh, a couple of things. Um, enforcement is, is a question I have. Obviously, it's really easy to make sure that we don't have a uh, retail store come into the city because they have to get, theoretically, a business license. But we have a huge problem even enforcing the number of dog limits in the city right now. Uh, we just had a, a, a circumstance where we uh, had someone that was re running a theoretical rescue that had many more than the number of, of dogs that than he should have had. And, uh, you know, I'm just in a position right now that I want to make sure that if we pass an ordinance that we are going to basically uh, use it to uh, ensure that, that these sorts of things don't happen. Uh, and, and I don't know how this defines how we're going to do that right now. The second thing is, uh, w how do we define a reputable breeder? I mean, it says it has to be a reputable breeder, but I, I would like the, the city attorney, if possible, to, to deal with people that are experts in this and, and put a section in the, the ordinance that defines what a reputable breeder is, because uh, one person's reputable breeder is another person's pu puppy mill in a lot of instances. So I, I just want to make sure that we have the teeth in this ordinance and that we're real clear about things because I agree with with Mr. Cerner that, that a reputable breeder should be defined. You know, obviously, if you have a, a person that's having continuous litters of, of puppies, that's obviously a pup, uh, puppy uh, mill of some sort. So uh, I, and that's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Betts. Uh, yeah, I've got the same concern. We've got uh, section 6.01.030 and says no backyard breeding. I don't know what defines, I imagine that um, somebody's raising AKC dogs for sale. It's in their backyard. I don't know where else it would be, um, in the side yard. So um, we've got to sort out, uh, you know, proponents of this uh, up here suggesting that Mr. Cerner shouldn't be allowed to raise his uh, dogs and sell the AKC registered animals. And then uh, city attorney's going to have to do something to fix this if the council thinks that. Uh, it wants to create that exception. So I'm waiting on the answer. Ms. Zavala. 
I would definitely agree that we do need to define what a reputable reader is. I would say if you have someone like Mr. Cerner who's certified, who has you know, the license to do it legally, I think that that's okay. And and I do agree there are plenty of, of dogs that do need to be adopted. However, there are also those people that just won't adopt a dog because they have a certain breed in mind that they want to have because they've fantasized about it their entire life. I know for me, the back of my head, I want a golden retriever one day. It's just, I read a book about it and ever since then, I just want one. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, sometimes people have those, you know, desires and, you know, wants. So I do think, you know, there's definitely that, you know, reaching that middle ground of making sure that people aren't overproducing dogs and under deplorable conditions versus someone who's doing it in a humane way for people who want that specific breed. Um, so I, that's my point of clarification, just making sure that we are being very clear about what is being allowed and what's not. Mr. City Attorney, could you develop um, uh, part of the ordinance based on the comments tonight if we were approved this ordinance with the comments made for a second reading later? Or would you prefer this come back with that language in it already for the for another first reading? I, I think I can make the changes between now and then. Now and the second reading? Yes. With so that. we're going to include a definition of what constitutes a what to def we need to define what a reputable breeder is. Correct. We need to determine whether there should be exceptions. I want to point out that in our zoning code, it's one of the listed prohibited home occupation uses is includes businesses which entail the breeding of dogs, cats, or other animals on the premises in residential areas. So that's something. We may have to revisit someday. Okay. So I, I can go ahead and come back in the second reading um, and make the changes that I've heard tonight. So if the council wanted a motion to move this forward, they could. It's up to you guys. Can I make a motion that we pass this ordinance with the exception on uh, with the inclusion of a definition of en enforcement and rep what a reputable breeder is? Is there a second? Second. Any more discussion? I see nobody else in the queue. Please vote. Mr. City Clerk. Motion passes unanimously. All right. With that, we'll move on to item number seven, the resolution accepting on behalf of the public for streets and utility purposes certain streets within the Rancho del Oro. Mr. Mayor. Yes, you have a conference. I have a home on one of those streets. All right. So I'm going to recuse. I'm at 65898 Avenida Cadena, I believe it is. It's one of the streets above Herb, but no better. But anyhow, it's certainly within 500 feet. Thank you. We'll wait for you to leave the room and we'll begin the item. Mr. City Attorney, do you want to lead, do you want to, lead to discussion on this? Um, sure. Um, this, this particular um, resolution is a resolution that will accept on um, except certain public streets within the Rancho del Oro subdivision um, for both utility purposes and for public street purposes. Um, in 1989, the project was approved and one of, the, some, one of the conditions of the maps that were approved is that the, upon completion of all the public improvements, the city, the developer was supposed to dedicate eight streets to the city and the city would accept those streets. And those streets included um, Choya Drive, Avenida Dorado, Avenida Ladera, El Rio Lane, Avenida Candena, Del Rey Lane, Avenida Barona, and West Drive. In August of 2013, the city council had um, adopted a resolution that accepted the streets and so that resolution formally ex accepted the streets into our system. However, there were some corrections that needed to be made to that particular ordinance that did not make it into the ordinance. And upon, um, in the context of some discussions we've been having, having with some representatives of Rancho del Oro on some park maintenance issues, we discovered that those changes needed to be made. And so what you have before you is a resolution that accepts these streets for those purposes and includes the changes or the changes that were made back in 2013. 
So it's a, this is basically a house, housekeeping matter. Thank you very much. We'll open up to public comment. Mr. Moon, did you want to speak on this item? Mr. Moon has been very instrumental in making sure that uh, this gets done correctly. He is a resident of that neighborhood, and I want to appreciate what you've done. Thank you. Is there any other comments from the public? All right, second call, last call. Public comments are closed on item seven. Move on to uh, council member discussion. Mayor Potemiki. Move staff for recommendation. And I will second. Or Parks will second. Is there any other discussion? Please vote. Mr. City Clerk. Motion passes with Councilmember Betts recused. You can go to sleep tonight. <laughs> can we bring Mr. Betts back, please? Item 8A, which is Homeland Security Grant, Chief Mondari. And, and I apologize to the council and the mayor for making this an urgency item. Um, however, I just found out yesterday um, that if we're going to apply for a Homeland Security grant, that it requires a, uh, a resolution from the governing body. And so the request is to authorize the city manager to be the authorized agent, and myself, I will be the grant manager. It's uh, the intention of the police department to apply for uh, basically a new locking security system at um, with, within the, the government center, if you will, the, the city buildings that would have access, uh, not necessarily from a key, but a key card. We have a number of, of keys that are out, that are unaccounted for, um, so on and so forth. And this way we can kind of uh, not only monitor who's coming in and out, but also restrict access to areas that people should not be and also to enhance safety of employees um, in the event of a terrorist attack. Um, and while it may be unlikely, I think that's something we need to plan for. And if we have specific areas that employees uh, um, and, and council can get themselves, lock themselves into, um, then that's gonna help enhance the, the, the security. So uh, um, anyway, we're, I'm in the process of, of working on that grant. It is, and the reason it's an urgency item, the grant is, is the submission deadline is Monday, May 2nd by five o'clock and we do not have another council meeting before then. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mayor Botemi Key. Uh, move the chief's recommendation. Second. There's a motion to second, any discussion? I see none, please vote. City Clerk. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I know items pulled from the consent calendar. Do I have any other public comments? Anybody did not speak in the public comment period at the beginning? You may speak now. Second call, last call. Public comments are closed. Uh, we are going to recess back into closed session as our items in the closed session were not finished. And we don't need to reannounce that, do we, Mr. City Attorney? Uh, no, we do not. All right, so we're recessing the closed session. Our next dates uh, for our meeting will be May 3rd here in the Carl May Center at 6 p.m. There's multiple other dates of committees on the website. Thank you for attending tonight.